Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the class. Uh, I'm Andrew Tong, the Affairs Director for International Affairs at LIA, and I will be the moderator for today's speech from Ambassador Candace State from Belize. So, I'll just very quickly go through uh, some brief introduction about the Ambassador. So, her the Ambassador Candace State has a service and this is presenting Belize in Taiwan since 2021. And if you actually go, go to Google and some, some of the uh, news, you do, you do see that our president and our minister for foreign affairs do, do meet with uh, embedded peace uh, uh, for some time. And prior to the role, she had been the educator for 11 years. She did a lot of teaching at the University of Belize and also an assistant professor in history at Albany State University and Jefferson University in the States. I got the areas you that in your alma, alma mater, right? So, uh, Ambassador Peace actually finished his uh, PhD study in Caribbean literature in 2014. And, and I, I remember you actually go to the state for a study of course since you are undergrad. And then we said, that's people to discuss, right? Yes, that's very cool. And then, and then, then she moved to some of the more, more diplomatic uh, position. And now, now that she's here. And for the Embassy of Belize, well, it was it started with the 1989, that's where we have a formal, a formal say, diplomatic relationship. And then now there was a group working on the visa issues and of course the trade situation. Actually, I remember that uh, there, your, the, the, the embassy actually got an award from our Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan for the, your bridge management for our the trade and all the tourism and all the collaboration between Belize and Taiwan. So, without further ado, let's have a round of applause. Let's welcome the uh, current state ambassador in this case. Good afternoon, everyone. I know that this is a late lecture, perhaps, or maybe not, one of the latest for the day for you. And uh, I was an educator before. So I am quite familiar with standing in front of so many beautiful and smart faces. And uh, even though it's a bit later in the evening, I'll try to make this lecture as engaging as possible so that you can um, acquire as much knowledge that you can perhaps apply in your classes and in your everyday life. So um, for the formalities, uh, Dr. Andrew Zong. Executive Director of International Affairs of National Taiwan University and the students of Taiwan, National Taiwan University. Again, good afternoon, Daja Hao. How? How? Okay. I thank you all for allowing me to di discuss this topic, global competence with internationalization at home that is important to countries of the world, but to our countries, Belize and Taiwan in particular. I will commence by directing your attention to two videos on the screen. The first video is a recording with our, the Prime Minister of Belize, Honorable Jan Bresenio, and the United States Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Anthony Blinken. Thank you very much, um, I was going to say 
and thank you very much for inviting us over here at, um, at your office. As we all know that the United States and Belize have had very close, strong, and warm relations over the past 41 years. We just celebrated our 41st um, anniversary of independence on last week, Wednesday. And you are right that there are so many issues that both countries we need to, to address the issue of climate change. Um, whereas it's almost like an ex existential threat for small yeah. countries like Belize that have a low um, line coastline, but it's also affecting big countries like yourself. You know, countries where in the US you have droughts, in the US you have excessive rains, and it is something that has to be addressed by all of us, not by individuals. And Belize continues to have a stellar record when it comes to the protection of its environment. We have just signed an, an agreement with uh, the Nature Conservancy and that we are going to protect 30% of our ocean space by 2026, four years ahead of schedule. And certainly the, the other issues of, of migration, of the war in Ukraine, where we strongly condemn the actions of, of Russia, um, issues of uh, migration, and also strengthening democracy in our region. So, um, thank you, um, Secretary, for inviting um, myself and my team to, to your office. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. As I mentioned, this video is a recording of the meeting between the Prime Minister of Belize, Honorable John Bresenio, and the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, in September 2022. One of the highlights of the video is the fact that Blinken found our Prime Minister's and Belize's support of Taiwan noteworthy enough to mention and commend it publicly and internationally. Now, the second video is an interview with the Foreign Minister of Belize, Honorable Eamon Courtney. I have received no pressure from China, whether direct or indirect. From time to time, we get messages from third parties or fourth parties that somebody in Taiwan, in China, wants to meet us or something like that. But we have above all of those. Uh, let me reaffirm our relation with Taiwan are solid, strong, excellent, and enduring. There is no intention of the government of the Prime Minister Center to change that. So. Here again, in this video, with our Foreign Minister, Honorable Courtney, reiterates Belize's support for Taiwan and Belize's uncompromising solidarity with Taiwan. Throughout this lecture, we will highlight the ways in which Belize and Taiwan are working together, and importantly, the ways in which Belize is helping. However, before we approach that juncture, I first want to introduce you to Belize. How did we become Belize? Our journey to sovereignty and nationhood and our acclamation of international recognition and respect and global competence that undergirds our foreign affairs and which certainly informs our diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. Historians have dated our history to the Mayan civilization, a civilization that was mostly demolished during the colonial period. And I am certain that the indigenous people of Taiwan can relate to the effects of colonial domination and exploitation. The first official name of Belize was British Honduras, a name that immediately invokes our colonial history. But although the British initially named Belize, the Spaniards were the first colonizers of Belize. However, Spain never settled Belize. 
As a result, the British buccaneers started to cut logwood and mahogany in the area that is now known as Belize. That, uh, but the first name was British Honduras, as you can see. And these are the enslaved Africans who were cutting the logwood and the mahogany uh, for the British buccaneers in the region that, is now, that, that was British Honduras and is now um, Belize. And I just want to inform that in other parts of the region in the, in the Caribbean um, where they had plantation slavery, meaning that the enslaved Africans were working on the sugar plantation, in Belize you had a forestry um, form of slavery, where the enslaved Africans were cutting logwood and mahogany for their colonial masters, which were uh, the British at the time. The Spaniards and the British signed a series of, of treaties over Belize. The last of these treaties was a Treaty of Versailles in which Spain granted the British buccaneers permission to cut the logwood and mahogany, providing they did not settle and establish a society in the area. The British buccaneers violated this treaty, however, through certain seeming social development in the area. As a result, the Spaniards who were stationed in the area of Mexico attempted to expel the British buccaneers from the area of Belize through force. However, the British buccaneers amassed the assistance of some 300 to 500 enslaved Africans they had in their possession to resist the Spaniards. This led to the historic Battle of St. George's Key in 1798, an event which we now commemorate as a national holiday in Belize every September 10th. So these are images of that um, historic battle. Some people, some Belizean, uh, question the veracity and the extent of the Battle of 1798. However, what is indisputable is that the Spaniards failed to expel the British from uh, Belize and to reclaim Belize from Britain. And this is the point at which Guatemala entered the conversation. And if it feels as though Guatemala's intervention um, came from left field, that is essentially how uh, many Belizeans do feel um, about uh, that intervention. But the whole story, the context of Guatemala is this. Guatemala, which would assume the Captain Generalancy of Central America, meaning that they assumed the power um, from Spain in that region. And so they posited that they inherited Spain's possessions in the region, including Belize. So where Spain failed to expel the British from the region and to reclaim uh, Belize, Guatemala entered the conversation with um, England and uh, they entered dialogue, they entered um, into negotiations. And in 1859, Guatemala and Britain signed a treaty that gave Britain sovereignty over Belize, providing though that a cart road was built from the capital of Guatemala to the coast of Belize. So uh, this was the colonial drafting of Central America. As you can see, this is Belize, um, which was formerly named British Honduras. Uh, this is Guatemala. And Guatemala um, requested that uh, in return for Britain to claim sovereignty over Belize, they were requesting that a cart road would have been built from the center of Guatemala to the coast of Belize, which, which would have been this area, um, assumingly to have access to the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean for commercial reasons, right? Um, and we will, re will later return to how this treaty would become the primary basis of Guatemala's persistent territorial claim of Belize. 
Following the 1859 treaty, Belize became a colony of Britain and a crown colony in 1862. And the country's name, for the very first time, this area, this landmass, was named British Honduras. So in 1862, it became a crown colony, and Britain named it British Honduras. And um, perhaps it was named British Honduras because here we already had a country to the south of us that is called Honduras, but this is a Spanish colony. So perhaps to make the distinction between the British colony and the Spanish colony, uh, Britain named this one British Honduras, right? So the aforementioned detail, details and information uh, help us to outline the colonial context of Belize. Now I want us to transition to the periods of independence and nationhood. Those who know world history, those of you who are familiar with world history, inform us, tell us, what monumental event took place in 1834 with respect to Britain and its, its British colonies? What took place in 1834? Anyone? We have a souvenir, a great souvenir for anyone who can answer that question. What happened in 1834? I see a hand going up. <laughs> So yes, you're going in the right uh, direction. The slave trade was abolished in 1807. And in 1834, Britain emancipated all of the enslaved Africans in its British colonies, right? Yes, they were emancipated. They were freed. Emancipation means that they were freed. Um, and there was a saying that um, the sun never set on the British colonies, which meant that Britain colonized a significant portion of the world. And in the, those colonies were um, mostly enslaved Africans. And so in 1834, though, those enslaved Africans were emancipated. Um, As a colony of Britain, the enslaved Africans in Belize were also emancipated. But this was more, this emancipation was more in theory than in practice because colonialism and slavery would leave a legacy of instability and deprivation. There were no resources or infrastructure in place to help these former enslaved Africans to improve their, their lives, to help them to live lives of uh, dignity. And so the objection of their material conditions that did not alter post-emancipation led to resistance in the, uh, to the colonial systems that the colonial so societies continue to safeguard. Uh, you found that many of these former enslaved Africans were uh, working without compensation or without compensation that, that was commensurate with the kind of work that they um, were doing. And their material conditions did not improve or their material conditions were similar to those of um, when they were actually enslaved. Uh, these sentiments led to nationalist agitations. In fact, there were nationalist impulses in Belize as early as the 1900s, not just in Belize, but the entire region. And this agitation was compounded by the labor movements of the 1930s that were spearheaded by Belizeans such as Antonio Soberanes. Remember, I, I mentioned just recently that um, they, were, uh, they felt that they were working in unfavorable conditions and they were working um, for compensation that 
uh, was not commensurate with the level, the extent of the work that they were doing. The 1950s in Belize witnessed the, sorry, So these are just uh, images of the labor movements in, in Belize. And I have to keep remembering to change the slide as I'm speaking. So. And OK. The 1950s witnessed the emergence of the first political parties in Belize, the People's United Party and the National Party, respectively. Um, perhaps two decades later would be the emergence of the first opposition party, um, the National Independence Party. Belize attained universal suffrage in 1954, which allowed Belizeans to participate in democratic elections. And then the, the independence movement. Belize attained internal self-government in 1963 which meant that internal self-government meant that we were in control of our internal affairs, but not our foreign affairs. Belize also changed its name from British Honduras to Belize in 1973. Remember, it was named British Honduras in 1862, and in 1973 was our first gesture of freedom to be able to start defining ourselves as a people. And so in 1973, we changed our name from British Honduras to Belize. I want to mention here, though, that there were paralleled nationalist movements unfolding all over the world. So all over the world, there was this wave of independence movement. For instance, in the Caribbean, not sure if you're familiar with the Caribbean, you should because there are some diplomatic allies of Belize, uh, sorry, of Taiwan that are from the Caribbean. But in the Caribbean, many of these countries were moving towards independence. In 1962, Jamaica attained its independence. In 1962, Trinidad and Tobago attained its independence. In 1966, Barbados attained its independence. In 1966, Guyana attained its independence, and many other countries. In Africa, for instance, in the 1960s, Nigeria, Kenya, Chad, and a number, I think it's almost 18 or 19 countries of Africa that attained their independence in the, in the 1960s. Also, in the Middle East, you had um, Kuwait, Oman, Yemen, that were uh, attaining their independence in the 1960s as well. These movements were bolstered in the 1960s by the United Nations General Assembly's declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, which became known as the Declaration on Decolonization and which was to bring colonialism in all its forms and manifestations to a speedy and unconditional end. Now, I mention this to say, I mention all of that to say this, that Belize attained self-governance in 1963, but our full independence was delayed until the 1980s, until 1981 to be specific, because of the lingering Guatemalan claim. Remember I mentioned that Guatemala entered negotiations with England and uh, their condition was that if they granted England sovereignty over Belize, that a cart road would have been built from Guatemala to the, east of Bel to the coast of Belize. Well, England did not meet that request and so Guatemala considered that treaty null and void. But that was a conversation and negotiation between Guatemala and Britain. Where we're concerned, we understood that our colonizer was Britain. We became a crown colony of Britain in 1862. 
So when we agitated for our independence, it was from Britain. Britain was our colonizer. We weren't in conversation with any other country. It was Britain. But our independence was delayed because of that lingering Guatemalan claim. Our first prime minister, the Honorable George Cadle Price, you will see here, uh, led the negotiations, um, the independence negotiations in England with other nationalists of Belize and even appealed to the international community to support us. Remember, the United Nations had already adopted that declaration on decolonization, and many countries of the world had signed on to that declaration. So it wasn't difficult for us to win the support of um, world leaders who were supporting countries that were agitating for their independence. So uh, we acquired uh, we garnered that support, and in 1981, on September 21st, 1981, Belize reclaimed its independence from Britain. We became an independent country, we became a sovereign people, we became a sovereign nation, and that is how we define ourselves since. The Guatemalan claim persists. Uh, to this day, unfortunately. Um, it is currently in, um, at the International Court of Justice and uh, everyone is just hoping for a peaceful settlement of that claim. But nevertheless, we are a sovereign people, a sovereign nation. That is how we define ourselves, right? Um, now, what does independence mean for us? With our independence came a new era of hope and optimism. We attained our political freedom. We choose our political representatives and we govern ourselves. We also have control of our national economy and our natural resources. We get to define our own national identity and chart the destiny of our people and our country. And this is just some, a, a view of who we are and what our country looks like today. This is our national flag. And as I've mentioned, our name was changed from British Honduras to Belize in 1973. This was our first Prime Minister, the Honorable George Cadle Price. This is our current Prime Minister, the Honorable John Bresenio. And this is our Governor General, a Mayan woman. She is the first indigenous person to assume this role, not just in Belize, but in the entire Commonwealth. Uh, this is a map of our country. Our country consists six of our country consists of six districts and keys. Um, the northern most district is that of Corozal, closest to Mexico. You have Orange Rock and Cayo, closest to Guatemala and a part of Mexico. To the south, you have Toledo. To the east, you have the district of Belize and Stan Creek, and you have the uh, islands on the coast. And this is the Great Barrier, we Barrier Reef. Sorry, we have the largest barrier reef in the Western Hemisphere. This is Belize in relation to Taiwan and the rest of the world. We have uh, six main ethnic groups in Belize, the Mayans, the Creoles, the Mestizos, the Garifuna, the East Indian, Mennonites. Uh, this is a breakdown of our population by percentage. The, uh, sorry. the largest percentage is that of the Mestizo, which is a mixture of descendants of Spaniards and Mayan. The Creole, descendants of Africans and a mixture of any other ethnic group. And you have the Mayans, you have the Garifuna, which is an ethnic group that, uh, sorry, uh, indigenous group of the Caribbean that migrated from St. Vincent and the Grenadines 
to Belize. Um, you have the East Indian from, uh, who migrated from India. You have the Mennonites from, some from uh, Germany, other Asians, and others. Uh, this is a, a photo of modern day Mayan community. As you can see, very traditional, and they have uh, many commonalities with some of the indigenous communities of, of Taiwan. Um, as you can see, their, um, how, their, their hut sorry, is, uh, has the grung as its, um, the earth as its flooring, and it's the, the roof is made of thatch and so forth. Is it possible that we can play the Mayan deer dance? So this is a traditional Mayan dance, which is known as the Mayan deer dance. These are photo photos of the Creoles, as I've mentioned. This is a mixture. This group is comprised of a mixture of African and any other uh, ethnic group. Uh, the Mestizos, a mixture of uh, the descendants of uh, Spaniards and the Mayans. Uh, the Garifunas, as I've mentioned, this is an ethnic group that is indigenous to the entire Caribbean. Um, and men uh, many of them migrated to Belize to es uh, escape uh, colonial colonialism and slavery in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Again, we have a short video of the Jankunu. Oh, you can't access? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, the East Indians who uh, migrated from India. And I have to mention that um, my lineage is comprised of East Indian and Creoles. So on my maternal side, we are descendants of East Indian, and on my paternal side, descendants of Creoles. And then the Mennonites, uh, who migrated from Germany. And some of our country features include the largest barrier reef in the Western Hemisphere, the Great Blue Hole, Maya Ruins, Rainforests, white sandy beaches, or national symbols. Um, these are photos of our great blue hole, our great blue hole. Um, it's renowned for uh, people around the world who are interested in um, diving. Uh, and just a photo of our intriguing under, uh, underwater world. Uh, these are photos of our Maya ruins. Uh, as I've mentioned, we have six dis districts of Belize, and in each district, there is at least one Maya ruin. And these Maya ruins are also integral to our uh, tourist industry. People from around the world would visit Belize to explore these Maya ruins. Uh, we are also well known for our rainforest and our many activities associated with the rainforest, zip lining, cave tubing, etc. I hope that you're being uh, enticed to visit Belize one day. In fact, I invite all of you to visit Belize. I will be your personal tour guide once you visit Belize. Um, also known for our white sandy beaches and our keys. And these are our national uh, symbols. As I've mentioned, the Belize flag, and here you have the national anthem. We don't have to play it today. This is our national flower, which is the black orchid. Um, our national bird, which is the toucan. Our national animal, the tapir. And our national uh, tree, which is the mahogany. Uh, these are some of our Belizean cuisines. Many of our Belizean cuisines are made from maize, from ground food, rice and beans, uh, marine products, and meat. 
This is a well-known um, cuisine from the Mestizos, which is called the Dukuno, one of my favorites. It's made from maize, and inside you have meat. Um, uh, these are other um, samples of our cuisines. Here you have the rice and the beans and the choice of meat and salad. Um, you have the ceviche, ceviche, sorry, and you can also have the cacao drinks. Okay, so from what you have observed from my brief slide, you can understand why we are, as Belizean, a proud and resilient people. We are a beautiful people, a beautiful mixture of people. We are a free people. We are a democratic society. We live in a free country. The journey to this freedom and independence, as you may have determined, was long and cumbersome. But we consider ourselves blessed and favored. Many countries are still fighting for their independence. Many countries have lost. We know the cost of independence, and so we continue to safeguard our sovereignty and our territorial integrity with all our might and fortitude. Importantly, we also support states and countries that are struggling to attain or maintain their sovereignty. I have hitherto outlined several benefits of our attainment of independence and nationhood. Concomitant with our sovereignty is our participation in international organizations and fora as a sovereign nation. We are a noteworthy actor in world affairs with a respected voice and vote. With our independence also came our responsibility and right to design our own foreign policies and choose our international friends. In Taiwan's regard, we have chosen Taiwan as a friend. And since Belize and Taiwan established diplomatic relations in 1989, we have maintained a durable and unbroken bond. We also use our respected voice to champion the cause of Taiwan internationally. Indeed, evidential in the two videos with my Belize's Prime Minister and Belize's uh, Foreign Minister. Belize has embraced every opportunity to advocate for Taiwan. Hence, Honorable Blinken's remarks to our Prime Minister. As an instrumentality of our foreign affairs, the Embassy of Belize in Taiwan has been established to facilitate political, social, and cultural missions to augment diplomatic ties between Belize and Taiwan. You may agree with this. For any relationship to function optimally, the people in such a relationship must engage efforts to know and understand each other. That is what we are doing here in Taiwan. During my own tenure, which started in 2021, our embassy of Belize in Taiwan has been very engaged in activities and events that would enable cultural exchanges and build people-to-people -people understanding between Belizeans and Taiwanese. And some of these events and initiatives include We had, we organized, last year we organized a Belize Cuisine Month, which, um, during which we had Belizean cuisines. All of those delectable cuisines that I showed you before, we had many of those um, available to the Taiwanese pu um, public, to the Taiwanese society during the month of November. Actually, incidentally, uh, it was around this time last year that we had the Belize Month, starting November 1st of 2021 to the end of November. 
We also organized a Belize Culture Month, during which we had um, paintings from Belizean artists uh, on display here in Taiwan. And these paintings were commissioned through a collaboration between the Belize Embassy and Cacho. Um, and the paintings displayed the beauty of Belize, as well as highlighted the diplomatic relationship between Belize and Taiwan. We also had our music, Belizean music on display, um, and other cultural artifacts and representations. Uh, the embassy participated in the Central American Diplomatic Allies Punkar Tour, which again allowed us to take our Belizean cuisines to all regions of, of Taiwan. So we wanted to reach Taiwanese in every nook and cranny so that to introduce them to who we are as a people through our food. We participated in the Taiwan Lantern Festival and had our famous Blue Hole and uh, Belize ecosystem um, on, on display. We also partner with private, uh, the private sector with um, NGOs to uh, introduce Belize to uh, the Taiwanese public here. Um, I was given a, a short lecture at a children's home um, and, and, and children who were part of an after, after school program. Uh, we partner with YoYo -Yo Charity Foundation to not just introduce, again, our cultures, but to sell um, our, our food and to help generate uh, funds for uh, children, Taiwanese children with developmental delay. Uh, we also partnered with other dip diplomatic allies of Taiwan to organize a beach cleanup. Um, and th this was another small gesture to Taiwan, just to show that we want to uh, give back that we, to, to the Taiwanese society, that we also want to help in whichever way that we can. I, also have to mention that we have, I don't know if we have in this audience, but we have a number of Belizean students here in Taiwan who are uh, cultural ambassadors in their own right. And um, in their engagements, in their interactions in, inside and outside of the classroom, they also, they learn and they also teach. I have also engaged uh, lectures to help inform and educate Taiwanese about uh, Belize and about the relationship between Belize and Taiwan. I have engaged a series of lectures um, in the indigenous communities. And this lecture here at NTU is also instantiates that objective to uh, reach Taiwanese, to introduce you to Belize, um, as well as to, to learn from you as well, and to let you know more about the relationship between Belize and Taiwan. Finally, I would like to mention here, at least in passing, that one of the first mandates to which I became familiar here in Taiwan, and which became indelible to me, is Taiwan's mandate to become a bilingual country by 2030. I hope you are familiar with that mandate. Having been made aware of this objective and having been um, an educator for so long and, have, um, and my passion for language and literature, I pitched an idea to other ambassadors from diplomatic allies here in Taiwan, which is to create a platform to help Taiwan internationalize at home by exposing Taiwanese to English and to our cultures through our histories, uh, uh, introduce Taiwanese to English and our cultures, histories, food, music, peoples through our books. And I'm hoping that I can uh, start a conversation here um, at NTU to see uh, how NTU can be situated in that um, initiative. Um, 
This initiative became known as PELDAT, Platform for English Language and Literature of Diplomatic Allies of Taiwan. And what we plan to do is to collaborate with academic and educational institutions in Taiwan to help ensure our books are on some of the reading lists uh, of these institutions. We would also visit uh, these institutions to read with students, and we actually have started that. Um, and these are some of the diplomatic allies of, of uh, Taiwan. I hope you're familiar with at least some of them. Uh, in the Caribbean, you have St. Lucia, you have Haiti, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, St. Kitts and Nevis. In Central America, you have Belize, Honduras, and Guatemala. South America, you have Paraguay. In Africa, you have Eswatini. Europe, you have Vatican. Um, in the uh, Pacific, you have Asia Pacific, you have the Martian, Marshall Islands, Palau, Nauru, Tuvalu, right? And these are some of the PELDAT engagements that we have had so far. Again, I am here reading with uh, children, introducing Taiwanese children to our cultures, our society through our books. And here you had one of my colleagues reading with uh, children at the um, National Central um, Library. As I've mentioned, we understand as diplomatic allies of Taiwan, we understand the symbiotic relationship between our countries and Taiwan. And for us to trust and support each other, we must get to know and understand each other. And these are some of the initiatives um, that would help us towards that objective. Now let me conclude this lecture. Let me conclude by expressing how impressed I am by NTU's decision to host this lecture series on global competence and internationalization at home. I am particularly intrigued by the team because of its significance and implications for countries such as ours. Given Taiwan's peculiar situatedness, in global affairs, it is imperative that universities such as NTU continue to prepare students in an interconnected world, a world in which peoples depend on each other and countries rely on their friends. I do hope you know Belize or you know more about Belize than you did before this lecture. As you have gathered from the videos, particularly with our Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, and Honorable Blinken, and from this lecture, Belize is one of Taiwan's most reliable diplomatic allies. Though smaller in population or land mass than, any, than other countries, Belize has chosen to deploy its most significant instrument of power and influence for the good of Taiwan. Belize has aligned its sovereignty, as you already determined, a hard-won sovereignty. But Belize aligned its sovereignty nonetheless to Taiwan, to stand in solidarity with Taiwan, a feat that many other larger countries have not done since. That gesture of Belize, that commitment of Belize is indisputably priceless. You can place no value on that kind of friendship. So yes, Belize is a friend of Taiwan and Belize is helping in the ways that it can. And I want to leave you with this video. She said in Taiwan, a rat and one do what he did make him happen. Listen, what did you make to go home? 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 We both stop working together. We do with this from 1989. We believe Together, so we're friendship, sharing with each other.
Just for context, this video, uh, this music video was also one of the video, uh, song vi videos that was commissioned through a collaboration um, of the Belize Embassy and Kato uh, to have Belizean musicians produce songs that uh, celebrate the friendship between Belize and Taiwan. And so the artists appropriately entitled the music video Work Together. All right. And that concludes this lecture. And I want to ask you to follow our uh, social media to be updated um, on the events and activities that our embassy uh, initiates. And if you are anywhere in the vicinity, please uh, stop in and visit us at our embassy or participate in any of our events and activities. Thank you, Dr. Pez, for your wonderful lecture. It was very informative. And my name is Maxwell. I am a junior in uh, the material science and engineering department. And uh, I was wondering, as Solis was, uh, uh, has a lot of different languages uh, in your country, and as uh, Belize having English as your official language, how do you guys to um, like preserve all the native languages and also concerning the rapid decreolization of the Creole language in Belize as uh, the Creole language in Belize is uh, English substrated uh, Creole language and as English is being the official language of uh, Belize now, such Creole language is uh, facing a very rapid decreolization uh, as to my knowledge and I'm just wondering how uh, you uh, um, preserve these languages. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so very much for that uh, detailed question. And your question harkens back to our colonial history. Um, English became our official language because we were colonized by Britain. However, our geographic location in Central America um, and the migration of Central American um, nationals to Belize also informs the heterogeneity of our languages. So even though English is our official language, at least 70% of the population speaks Spanish fluently. Uh, at least 90% of the population speaks Creole fluently. I want to say that in many households, that uh, many families would communicate with each other 
in English. Sorry, sorry, in Creole. In Creole. So in the household, they would communicate uh, in Creole. However, in academic institu institutions or in professional setting, you find that many professionals would communicate in English. To your question of the decreolization, to my knowledge, that is not uh, a prominent um, issue that we have. As I've mentioned, many people do communicate um, interpersonally in, in Creole. So it is a language that I don't think that, um, and I deliberately refer to it as a language, though um, many people, uh, many linguists do not consider it an official language. For us, it is a, a, a formal language. Um, so we do communicate in Creole, we do communicate in English, we do com uh, communicate in Spanish, and the Garifuna ethnic group, they also have their own uh, language that they have been retaining um, as much as possible. things that uh, when I was like searching uh, about Belize, I found that your motto uh, is Sapumbla, Umbra Floreo, right? So, Umbra Floreo. So, Umbra it's Floreo. Latin. Yeah, it's a Latin. May I ask about the story behind the, the motto? Because I found that most motto uh, is always related to like the sun and the lights, and but this one is a little different, you see. That's, a, that's another very interesting um, question. And again, it harkens back to our colonial history um, and our Lagwood and mahogany industry. Um, so ombro, flora, translated to English means under the shade we flourish. Under the shade of the mahogany we flourish. In fact, if uh, we had the uh, the national fl uh, flag, if I can go back to that quickly. Hmm. There. So uh, this is the motto, sub umbra, floria. And, and as you can see, you have uh, two figuration, two human figuration. And in their hand, you have the paddle and the axe. The axe is for the mahogany and the paddle is for um, uh, the dory, or yeah, the dory, <laughs> uh, the, the small boat that they, ha they have to paddle. Um, and this is the mahogany tree. So the, so the, the motto actually um, is associated with the lagwood and mahogany industry, which was the basis of our national economy. Thanks for your sharing. My name is Boris. I'm a senior teacher in Tabo. And I have one question. You just said that you invited all, us all to visit this one day, but I just uh, do some little research that the uh, crime rate just struck me. So how, how do you uh, address these issues so that I will visit your parents. Okay, so good question again, and a responsible question that tourists uh, ought to ask. I would say, however, that our issue of um, crime is not uh, unique to a country um, such as Belize. There are other countries in the region that have, um, I would say, even higher uh, crime rate. And in Belize, that specification of um, 
criminal activity or co uh, criminal concentration is, usu is usually between um, uh, rival gangs, you know, in certain areas. So it's not a, it, it is not activities, it's not criminal activities that are perpetrated against people outside of whatever uh, groupings they are. Um, you wouldn't hear that a tourist is being mugged or, or a, a tourist is exposed to these criminal elements. In fact, uh, not even myself or people in Belize who are not a part of these gangs or these rivalries. Um, we are not vulnerable. We don't find ourselves threatened by those activities because we are not a part of it. Um, and when I've enc encountered questions such as these before, um, I also address these questions in terms of uh, uh, juxtaposition. I wonder if I were a representative, say, from, just as an example, say from the United States, if I would have been asked um, about the situation of crime in the United States. And we do know, I've lived in the United States, I consider the United States a second home, actually. Have you lived in the United States for almost 20 years? Um, and so I'm very familiar with certain states and certain cities. And I can tell you that certain cities in the United States are very, uh, they have very, very high crime rate. Um, but I understand, again, the dynamics of those um, criminal activities. But then I don't hear people asking representatives of the United States about the crime situation or whether or not that would be a deterrent for them to visit the United States. I've seen people flop, want to go to the United States. The point I'm making is that, um, as I've mentioned before, the crime situation in a country of, like Belize is not unique uh, to Belize and uh, it's not a deterrent for people to visit Belize, people to do business in Belize. I've never, um, even as ambassador, heard or received any complaints that any tourist, you know, had any uh, such encounter or anyone from who uh, was interested in doing business in Belize had any such encounter. So rest assured, should you visit Belize, you will have a very pleasant experience. I hope this answered your question. Yes? Um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Ms. Pitts. Okay, so um, I, I give you a little bit of earnest with your suit today. Oh, oh thank you. You know what they said to me? They said that I was, uh, I was wearing a Nancy Pelosi collar <laughs> and suit. I came ready, yes. So and I've heard that pink, pink is now the, by the way, pink is my favorite color. But now I've heard that pink is now the color of courage and bravery. And so I decided to wear this color today as well. So thank you. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so I'm Chelsea from the Department of Psychology and I'm currently a sophomore. And my question, um, so I'm interested in the Mayan deer dance. So. Um, you mentioned that it is related to the Spaniards, and I want to know why it is it deers? What does it represent? Why deers? I <laughs> understand. Um, and I don't have the uh, specific details, but I do know that in some indigenous uh, communities here in Taiwan, that um, they would uh, 
they would do a similar dance, you know, for um, uh, uh, referring to the sacredness of certain animals. And I want to um, believe, and I can get back to you on this with the uh, uh, accurate and specific uh, details, but the theirs are sacred to the Mayans. And so it's a um, celebration of that part of their belief system, yes. But I, I will definitely get back to you with the more specific details. Um, hello, my name is Calvin. I'm also a exchange student, same with myself. Um, I would like to ask to Ms. Pitts regarding the, um, the relationship between Taiwan and Belize. As you know, uh, the PRC or China have been swaying Taiwan's diplomatic allies for this past, for these recent years by investing a lot, just basically throwing money at Taiwan diplomatic allies and this speech recognition. So how did Belize can withstand this pressure from the PRC China? Uh, that is my question. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I, I think uh, both our prime minister and our foreign minister helped us in answering that question. As you can see, our foreign minister, who is my boss, <laughs> um, made it very clear in the, his interview that Belize stands in solidarity with Taiwan. He even mentioned that he has heard you know, rumors, which uh, he's not a man to entertain uh, rumors, um, that uh, the PRC is trying to reach out. But what I can say is that unlike those regimes um, that foster relationships that are based on coercion, that are based on intimidation, that are based on control. Belize and Taiwan's relationship is grounded in mutual respect, the seeking of understanding, and the promotion of mutual beneficial corporations. And so um, that is what Belize values. That is what Belize values. And we stand in solidarity with like-minded um, friends and uh, uh, diplomatic allies that are in pursuit of safeguarding democracy and in pursuit of their sover sovereignty. Remember, Belize had to struggle to attain its sovereignty, and, and we know uh, what it cost to attain your sovereignty and what it costs to maintain your sovereignty. And so we continue to support uh, countries that are pursuing um, sovereignty and uh, trying to safeguard their territorial integrity. And so that is why we also still stand in solidarity with Taiwan. Uh, hi, my name is Fausto. I'm from the Department of Economics and I'm actually from Honduras. So really uh, close to Belize. Uh, first, I wanted to kind of give some insight into the question of the previous student about the Deers and the Mayans. Uh, the Deers and the Mayans are closely related mostly because Deer is native to Honduras, well, the area that the Mayans live in, right? Not native to Honduras, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that, but native to that area of the Mayans. How do I know this? Because Honduras, West Coast, yes, West Coast, well, not really coast, but West part of Honduras, has uh, also Mayan influence. Yes. Copan, uh, all this area of Honduras has uh, Mayan influence. Yes. And deer is actually the national animal of Honduras. Yes, <laughs> so that's why I know this. But that's not my question, this is one or two, I have some, uh, some of that question, it's still coming. Just wanted to make an input. Okay. Yeah, 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 put my thoughts as for Honduras. Okay. Thank you. But my question is because as a Honduran, of course, you already mentioned this, we were conquered by different groups of people, that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And 
we of course got our independence way way earlier than Belize right. and during that period of time between our independence and your independence we worked for a short period of time uh, a single republic Central America was a single republic uh, Guatemala, Salvador, Iraq, all these countries were a single republic and but the now, captain general general Nancy was in Guatemala, in Guatemala yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and sort of we grew or at least I grew as I'm doing with the idea that Central America should at one point become that old republic that it once was unity among our Central American brothers but knowing that during that time Belize was still a colony uh, my question is how does Belize see itself now as a part of Central America? Does it see Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador as brothers or just as these guys that got their independence early? <laughs> no, 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 no. As, I, as I've mentioned, um, well, you know, we don't have control over our colonial history, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's why we struggle for our independence. But um, to answer your question, Because we were first colonized by Spain, we still do have uh, some Spanish influence, some yeah, Spanish influence um, in our societies, in our cultures. That's one part. The second part is that because we're situated in Central America, and as you've mentioned, we have our neighbors, Mexico, we have Guatemala, uh, Honduras, um, other countries in Central America and the migration of these um, nationals to Belize, you have um, an inter, beautiful intermixture. I also mentioned that though English is the official language of Belize, at least 70% of the population speaks Spanish fluently. I am saying all this to say that we are geographically, geopolitically located in Central America, and we also are a part of the Caribbean um, polity. We are a part of CICA, Central American Integration uh, System, and we are a member of CARICOM, which places us um, with the Caribbean communities. So we do see all of Central America as our allies and all of the Caribbean as our allies. In fact, I have um, said to people who have asked about visiting Belize, I've said that if you want a taste of Central America and the Caribbean in one package, you should definitely visit Belize because we are geopolitically located in Central America, but we are also um, a, part of the, uh, a part of the Caribbean, so we have allies in both places. So we do see you all as uh, Central America as our allies, not just as, as you have said, those little guys over there. No. <laughs> I personally have a question to follow up with about this. So um, I do see that in Belize there are many people from different cultural backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. They're from Maya, they're from Hispania, and they're from some people from Africa. And from my understanding, Taiwan is that uh, with, with different cultural backgrounds, people usually, they will have, to some extent, some disagreement. And you, when, when you go to the product, it will be, sometimes it will be different. So, I mean, when you are getting your sovereignty, putting your independence, uh, is there any, any like, disagreement or in, in any, any kind of form between the different cultural backgrounds? And then if there's, if there's any, and how do you stop that? And how do you work together to, to make sure that you want to be one country, I mean, in this, in this place? I, I do not. Uh, I want to say that indeed, um, there are some leg uh, remnants of the colonial legacy in our uh, country, um, and by that I mean that um, you know during the period of colonialism and slavery, the colonizers um, made a division. Um, have you heard of the divide and conquer concept? 
um, well, the, the colonizers used to um, make those who were closer in appearance to the, col uh, to the colonizers um, feel as though they were superior to um, uh, others who may have looked darker or um, of African descendants. Um, and of African descent. And that legacy, unfortunately, um, continued to an extent um, in some parts uh, of the country. Some Belizeans would, 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 would argue. Um, I have not, to be very um, fair and to be honest, I have not encountered uh, discrimination or um, it wasn't a reality for, for me, um, growing up or, uh, as a Belizean still. But perhaps some may argue that. I said that though because I am aware of the history and I am aware of the remnants of the systems of colonialism and legacy wherever these manifested themselves. And so I wouldn't be surprised if some Belizeans would make that argument. But to answer your question specifically, whatever division they may have been, whether it was based on politics, whether it was based on religion, whether it was based on the color of one's skin, I think that would have been, um, that would have been completely subordinate um, to that ultimate objective of independence. So when we move towards our um, independence, it was with a singular um, drive, a singular um, objective to become a sovereign people. So there, were, there was no quarrel there in terms of the negotiations, in terms of the dialogue um, uh, with Britain to reclaim our independence, which we successfully did in, on September 21st, 1981. Thank you. So, uh, so we do have some questions from our slide, though. I think I'll quickly go through some of them and see if we can answer that. Uh, so the first one is necessary. I'm um, here than questions, so I'm extremely touched by such a strong friendship between police and Taiwan. Thank you so much for the lecture and the The second one is about, about the colonial history. I want to know about the main industry now in police. Is, still, is it still being affected by the colonial history? And so some of our major industries at this moment uh, currently um, are the tourism industry, tourism in industry. So we will do what we need to do to attract uh, tourists to Belize because it's one of our major industries. Um, we also have aquaculture, uh, the marine, um, agriculture, uh, citrus, um, and we are uh, experimenting with uh, new industries as well. But those are some of our major ones. Okay, thank you. The next one, I, I'm also very curious about this. So how does climate change impact Belize, Belize come and what measures is Belize taking to fight for this? And does Belize engage in international agreements? Because I remember when your partners would meet with the, the in, in the same what you mentioned about the, about the importance of the climate change and how it will affect the mm -hmm. So, if you see anything you can share with us? Uh, this is a very, very um, important question. And yes, indeed, as a small and developing uh, country, and a country where uh, a huge percentage of our population relies on um, the coast, on uh, our ocean space for our livelihood, and the fact that our country um, has a low-lying coastal area, we are one of those countries that are vulnerable to climate change, and we suffer uh, drastic effects of 
climate change. In fact, unfortunately, I am slightly, and maybe I have been able to maintain it or contain it or maintain my composure, but I'm a bit uh, emotional and concerned today because there's a category one hurricane that is currently, as I speak, as I stand before you, uh, wreaking havoc on our country. And it's a very small country. And from um, what I have, the images that I have seen, uh, there are at least um, three, the flood in the city um, is at least three feet high. Um, but I have heard that our barrier reef, as I've mentioned, we have the largest barrier reef in the uh, Western Hemisphere, and that barrier reef has been helping us to resist some of the pressure and the impact of um, this hurricane. But still, we are uh, experiencing great damage um, from this hurricane. So uh, what are some of the intervention, uh, what, is some, what are some of the interventions that Belize is making? As the Prime Minister had mentioned, um, we had entered um, a contract with the National Con uh, Conservant the Nature Conservancy um, to restructure Belize's bond and in return to the restructuring of our, sorry, to, restructuring, to restructure our debt. Um, and in return for the restructuring of that debt, we need to conserve at least 30% of our um, ocean space. Uh, as you have, may be aware, that um, the ocean um, is globally is um, becoming more and more acidic, is becoming more and more uh, heated, um, and is a part of the issue of climate change. And so one of the commitments that Belize is making is to conserve uh, at least 30% of its ocean space. So that's one tangible um, uh, commitment that we are making. And my prime minister and other leaders in, of Belize have also joined world leaders in um, advocating for other industrialized countries who are some of the major um, carbon emitters to get on board and to also uh, join in that advocacy to ensure that we reach our um, net zero uh, goal by, by, by the deadline. So our leaders have also joined um, that advocacy. So these are some of the interventions that Belize have been making, has been making. Okay, so indeed the queen had um, passed away, um, but now we have a king. So long live the king. And so <laughs> the king is now our um, uh, head of state. And uh, indeed other countries are engaged in the talks of um, be becoming republic. Uh, but this is not a decision for, uh, for me to make or for uh, any one person in Belize to make, it would have to go to a referendum and uh, the people will decide whether or not they want to keep the king as our head of state or if uh, they think that it's time for us to become a republic. I think uh, it's about time for this for today and thank you so much for the festivities and thank you for the general insight of talking about Belize and Taiwan. So let's have a round of applause again for the end of the